It does look like we're back up on uh, on YouTube at the moment. Still waiting for a live video from Facebook, so we're going to have to shun Facebook, I guess, for tonight for some reason. It's not picking up the stream. Um, but anyway, we'll uh, welcome people, people back, I guess, to uh, YouTube. Maybe we'll get some people from uh, Facebook over on YouTube joining us tonight. And uh, let's just make sure that we're still live. People are seeing us here on, on YouTube. We're in about 30 seconds in right now, so I think we're probably okay. Just want to check my audio mix here, and we've got sound going through okay. Concurrent viewer. We have one concurrent viewer on uh, YouTube at the moment, so I guess that's that's a good thing. Waiting for comments. If somebody would like to comment on our uh, on our feed here, please. Having some issues again tonight, some technical issues with Facebook at the moment. It's not receiving the, uh, the stream for whatever reason. But I'm we're, we're, up, uh, we're up right now. We're good. Okay, hey, Maggie. Robert says we're good. That is what we are. Perfect. Okay, we're up and running. Hey, good. Well, glitches are glitches, <laughs> and uh, that's what tends to happen with our show every once in a while. I ran this stream three times today, three tests on it, and it worked perfect all three times. Should have ran it twice. I should have ran it yeah. twice. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> I am going to keep the YouTube. Uh, I'm going to keep the Facebook uh, stream up there anyway, just in case it does come on. But uh, in the meantime, we'll uh, we'll continue on, and hopefully those folks that are out on Facebook land saw my message to join us over on YouTube. So I guess uh, good evening everybody, and welcome back to our Sunday night offering of astronomy outreach. Uh, we're here at least half half of the uh, crowd will have um, the Sunday night astronomy show. First of all, I'd like to welcome back uh, Royal Astronomical Society of Canada NB chapter members Paul Owen. From the Moon Shadow Observatory in Hampton, and Mike Powell here from the PFO Observatory in St. John. Welcome, guys. <laughs> yes. And uh, I'd like to give us give a uh, chicken coop salute there to my brother that's out in uh, TV land, brother Danny, watching the show tonight. Good evening, Dan. One of our most faithful followers watches every show. Um, anyway, uh, tonight we do have another mixture of topics to discuss for you. First of all, we're going to get started with a little bit of a look at what's uh, up in space this week. And then uh, Mike is going to present a discussion around uh, getting the most out of your DSLR camera, CCD and eyepiece filters, saving a few bucks, hopefully. Then we're going to have Paul's going to present another of his interesting segments on Rosanna's Fun Facts. Uh, this one discusses a bit about a meteorite crash, I believe, Paul, into a house. It is. Interesting. Uh, smashing, and, smashing, and, yeah, story. smashing story, <laughs> and yes, it can happen. Uh, it did, <laughs> it did, yeah. <laughs> and then we're going to take a look at your wonderful photo submissions for the week. Um, and then Paul's going to be back to continue his discussion on uh, DSLR um, processing. I believe um, his topic is uh, beginners astrophotography with just a DSLR. Uh, so he'll be carrying on with that part of the topic. And if we have time, we'll take a quick look at uh, what's to come in the night sky over the next week or so. So uh, another full show on the way. So folks, uh, sit back and relax. And remember, this is a live broadcast. So if you have any questions about the night sky, we're happy to try to answer them here for you. So let's get started, I guess, with a talk about uh, what's new in space this week. And again, folks, uh, sorry about the, uh, the Facebook uh, glitch, but uh, we are here on YouTube. And hopefully everybody can get to us. We decided to go to YouTube because people can get to YouTube. And some YouTubers may not be on Facebook. So... Um, I did put a post up there. Hopefully it took that uh, people know that we're over here now. For tonight, anyway. I uh, still don't see anything coming through Facebook, so we'll uh, continue on. Just rearranging my screens to uh, get them optimal here for myself. I get sitting in front of the three screens here, so. Really an odd, odd setup there with Facebook. Anyway. Let's go to uh, what's up in space this week. If I can get my notes. Oh. Get a fair amount of notes here for what's up in space. So, Hang on. We need music for that one, too. We, we do, yeah. yeah, we do, what's, yeah. Up oh, oh, oh. what's up in space? What's up in space? Okay, I'm going to share my screen here. And we want to put ourselves to full screen. There we go. Okay, here come a few photographs, I hope. I hope. 
We'll see if they we'll see if they appear. Oh, there they are. There they are. Okay. There they are. Let me sure if I get my OBS up to I get to uh, see it too. Oh, more glitches. Here we go. Okay, we're up. I'm uh, looking at my stats. Okay, ready. Parker Solar Probe speeds toward record-setting approach, close approach to the sun. Propelled by a midsummer flyby of Venus, NASA's Parker Solar Probe has started yet another record-setting science-gathering swing around the sun and its sixth flyby of our star. Some instruments on the spacecraft have been turned on since late August, collecting data on the near-sun environment and the solar wind as it streams from our star. At closest approach, called perihelion, on September the 27th, uh, Parker Solar Probe, that's today of course, will, be, uh, will come within about 13.5 million kilometers of the sun's surface, while moving at a speed of 466,592 kilometers per hour. Wow. That's chucking along, isn't it? Wow. Uh, shattering its own records on both counts. Um, so this also marks the first time that Parker Solar Probe will dip to within 0.1 astronomical units of the sun's center. Uh, an astronomical unit, of course, is 160 million kilometers, the average distance between the Earth and the Sun. So two years uh, into its journey, um, Parker Solar Probe remains healthy and operating normally. As it continues its seven-year mission, the spacecraft will eventually travel to within four million miles of the Sun's extremely hot surface. The mission's uh, primary goal is to provide new data on solar activity and the workings of the sun's outer atmosphere, the corona, which contributes significantly to our ability to forecast major space weather events that impact life on Earth. That's all I got to say about that one. Oh, well. Wow. Next up, a newfound Earth-sized exoplanet drives home the close ties between math and astronomy. Scientists have found an alien world that orbits its host star every 3.14 days a close proximity of the famous mathematical constant pi, the ratio between the circle's circumference and its diameter. Um, the exoplanet called uh, K2-315b uh, orbits a dwarf star that lies 186 light years from Earth, a new study reports. K2-315b was spotted in data gathered in 2017 during the extended K2 mission of NASA's Kepler Space Telescope and was confirmed using 2020 observations by a network of ground-based telescopes. So it orbits its sun every 3.14 days. The Pi, the Pi planet. Pi or square? ba doom, -doom. <laughs> Paul, Paul, drum roll, ba doom, -doom. Ba -doom boom oh. oh. Thank you. <laughs> I'm almost going there. There. I got in trouble going to school because they said pie or square. I said, no, pie or round, cake or square. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes cake or round. <laughs> Saturn's geyser-spewing moon Enceladus may even uh, be, may, may be even more active than scientists had thought. Fresh images created using data from NASA's dead Cassini spacecraft show that Enceladus's northern hemisphere was resurfaced with ice relatively recently. This new information adds to the known activity in the southern hemisphere where Cassini spotted more than 100 geysers blasting icy water into space. Researchers spotted the northern changes after looking at the heat signature of Enceladus using reflected sunlight, parsed with Cassini's visible and infrared mapping spectrometer instrument, or VIMS. Enceladus is one of the more promising abodes for alien life in the solar system. In addition to the subsurface ocean and geological activity, the moon likely has an energy source that organisms can tap into, chemical reactions perhaps similar to those that sustain life near Earth's deep-sea hydrothermal vents. So if there's any chance of life in our solar system, it either exists here on the moon of Enceladus under the uh, ice or on the moon of Europa, of Jupiter, I guess. That's the other good candidate. Well, next up, media production company Space Hero Inc. wants to film a contestant's trip to the International Space Station in 2023. This would be the first world's first reality show set in space. It's being re referred to as the Space Hero series, and the premise that 
is that one lucky winner will be selected to go to space out of several contestants. According to the show's creators, a seat for the winner has already been booked on an Elon Musk SpaceX Crew Dragon spaceship. NASA has confirmed that it is in discussions with Space Hero Inc. about the TV show. The contest is to find a suitable spacegoer uh, would be worldwide, so almost anyone could apply. And oh. the production crew wants to find a space-loving individuals. And once they're selected, the people would be fi filmed going through grueling astronaut training. This means a high level of fitness would probably be needed from the candidates. That puts me out. You guys, I don't know. <laughs> no. <laughs> Map out. Uh, <laughs> the aim is for the audience to pick their favorite person to send to space. And then when the winner has been picked, they would be blasted off to the ISS for 10 days and filmed during the whole time from takeoff to landing. Space Hero Inc. is also working with a private space company called Axiom Space, and Axiom is aiming to send paying customers to space as early as next year. This isn't the first time a space reality TV show has been in the works, though, so we'll have to be patient and see if it comes to fruition. That'd be a reality show I probably would watch. Yes. I'd want to be a contestant. Huh? I'd want to be a contestant. I think I would, too. You're the next contestant on the Space is Right. <laughs> Sorry, you played too much to go to space. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, uh, bringing back Weekly World News, Kickstarter. <laughs> <laughs> a previous and perhaps future true source of all things alien is in the middle of a Kickstarter campaign at the moment. Uh, Weekly World News went out of print back in 2015, but they are trying to revive it once again in their new campaign, much to the delight of supermarket goers everywhere. Uh, the world's only, the quote, the world's only reliable news, unquote, began as a weekly print publication in 1979. And since then, Weekly World News has become the authority on many topics. The editor states, in particular, we are the experts on aliens, uh, mutants, <laughs> God. cryptids, conspiracy theories, biblical prophecies, and cutting-edge unique health cures. We've published over 100,000 articles. <laughs> to the moon! <laughs> and are the only publication in the world to cover the exploits of Bat Boy, Manigator, the Lake Erie Monster, uh, P PhD Ape, uh, P-Lod, the alien, spy cat, Bigfoot hooker, and hundreds of other beings. So if you don't believe your eyes, follow these guys and support them in their Kickstarter campaign to bring that much-valued print back to your checkout line and to help support future true alien stories here on our show. So do you think that cow was looking for the utter space suit? <laughs> And a space tramp visits Trump. Space tramps visit Trump. Yeah. <laughs> so we have uh, Bat, Bat Boy and uh, Bigfoot are going for the 2020 run. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, hopefully we'll find lots of good alien stories coming up uh, if they ever get their print back in play. So I'm I'm rooting for them myself. I'm yeah. subscribing to that for sure. <laughs> I don't know if you want to watch this or not. I don't know if you can get this. Can't hear it. You can't hear it. Oh, too bad. Oh, that's a shame. I'll save that for next week. <laughs> Elvis, <you know. laughs> oh my goodness. <clears throat> oh, that's great. I love it. Anyway, yeah. that's what's new in space this week. I so, like the gal who was charming the hot dogs. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Classic. <laughs> Oh well, there are those you know some those stories are hard to find. That's of all the weekly space stories I I come up with, the the funny ones or the weird ones are really hard. There's really not that many weird ones out there. Well, they're not weird. They're true. No, they're true. That's right. So is this? Yeah. So I'm I'm really looking forward to this guy. These guys getting back again because I need some more sources for good stories. Oh my. Anyway. Oh, that was funny. Oh, Maggie says they were hearing it. Oh, they were. They were okay. hearing. Oh, maybe you just weren't hearing it. Were you hearing it, Paul or uh, Mike? No, I didn't hear it. You didn't but, hear it either. Uh, no, I we don't. Hear it. They hear it out in TV land. But okay. Yeah. All right. Let's let's do it one more time. Yeah, play it. It'll, play it'll, it. Only, it'll only take a second. Yeah. Uh, so we can find it again. Because it is it is the weekly world. What it is? It's their new theme song. Okay. So 
maybe you can maybe you guys can play it on your youtube can you look into YouTube? i'm gonna try it yeah. Yeah, okay. go ahead all right what we got i'll bring it up okay let me go back to present now look into your screen and uh we'll go to oh, we're on youtube or facebook we're on uh we're on youtube. youtube i'll bring it up i can get it okay we just need eight seconds of silence before it starts okay you know what? <laughs> eight seconds of st okay yeah we do the leg oh why is not going over that screen now <laughs> what a night oh what a night everything will be all right I think we can see it there now. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Here we go. It's a, it's a new musical theme. That's why I want to play it because if people are thinking about joining their Kickstarter campaign, you really should know who they're all about, right? Yeah. Yeah. So here we go. If people are thinking about joining their Kickstarter campaign, you really should know who they're all about, right? Yeah. Here, Nacko. There. We can hear it. Yeah. Mike, you're too loud. You can see why I, I suggest people sponsor it, right? I love it. How do you follow that? <laughs> You're going to try. You're up next. All right, Mike. <clears throat> really classy, Amelia. I know. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> The show just hit, the show just hit a new low, but <laughs> well, if it, if, it, if it comes from the Inquirer, it's true, right? That, well, that's true. And if it comes from Weekly World News, is even truer. <laughs> We're gonna find out as they, as I'm really hoping they get their uh, Kickstarter campaign going. So, anyway, I'll be sponsoring them. I love you guys. <laughs> okay, Mike. Uh, I guess you're gonna be up. You're gonna be talking about uh, filters for us. Well, Kind of. It's okay. just a filter adapters is more or less what it is. Okay. When I bought my 294 camera, uh, it came with all these little goodies and, you know, extension tubes and different sizes and stuff. And it also came with this little adapter. And I thought, now, what the heck was that for? Because, of course, they don't give you any instructions in the box. But what that turned out to be was an adapter to go from uh, a two inch to an inch and a quarter. So normally, you know, you have a two-inch eyepiece, you have a two-inch filter, you can just screw it on, and away you go. You drop that into your diagonal, and you're doing you're with a filter on the end of it. But I thought, if you don't have a two-inch filter, what would this adapter work like? So you can actually, not only does it screw onto your camera, but it screws onto your two-inch eyepiece, and then you can put an inch and a quarter filter on it. And believe it or not, it works really, really well. <laughs> I guess the focal length is close enough that there's nothing blocking, you know, when you reduce it down to inch and a quarter, there's nothing really blocking the, the, the view. And uh, when I've looked through that one, and that's a 50 millimeter eyepiece, the view is uninhibited. It just it works beautifully. So I thought, isn't that the coolest thing? You know, that you can basically buy half the filters. You don't have to buy a set of two inch filters. You just buy a set of inch and a quarter and use a step down like that one from inch and a quarter or two inch to inch and a quarter 
and you can use inch and a quarter filters. So that's uh, one of the things I'm actually going to try and see how it works. Uh, so then I thought, I got thinking, I went, well, if they make a reducer for that, I wonder what you can do for your camera. Because these two inch filters that I have, are, uh, they're pretty close to the, the filters that I bought for my camera size, but they're off. So I went on eBay, sure enough, they make a step ring. And this step ring is a 58 to 48 millimeter step ring. And I can take my two inch filters and I can screw them on like that to the step ring. And then I can take my 58 millimeter diameter lens, screw that on, and now I can use my two inch uh, astronomical filters that I use on my camera out in the observatory on my scope and use it right on the end of my camera. I can put an O3 on there. I can put a, a moon and sky glow filter on there. I can put a you know, high contrast filter on there, anything I like. And uh, again, I found it had no uh, vague netting or anything like that when I use it on a 300 millimeter lens. So I thought, you know something, I don't have to buy the clip-ins for my, my camera. All I have to do is use a step ring and put my, my filters on the end. Now, I haven't tried it. But uh, these filters that I have are made for, you know, the, my CCD camera that are out in the observatory. So I'm sure they will work exactly the same as they, you know, on this camera. And uh, they just, uh, with a step ring, I can use them with uh, any lens that has a 50 millimeter or 58 millimeter diameter, which 90% of my lenses do. So I thought that was a cool thing. So then I thought, okay, if that actually works, why couldn't I? Take the two inch filter off. And once again, take that inch and a quarter step ring, put an inch and a quarter filter in there, and screw that on the end of my camera. And how much blockage do I get? Believe it or not, on this 300 millimeter lens, when I point it at an object, it looks like it's uninhibited. You don't notice that it's been stepped down to an inch and a quarter. So, you know, basically I'd love to, can't wait to get out and give this a try and see if it actually works, uh, you know, on the night sky, taking shots of, say, the Orion Nebula or, uh, you know, uh, M57 uh, with some, you know, an O3 filter on there and see if my inch and a quarter filters on this camera lens will actually work. I don't see why they shouldn't, but it's just one of those things where, Instead of buying twice, you know, twice the filters, you need two inch filters for this or inch and a quarter for that, or you need clip in filters for this. You can just buy step rings and adapters and use your existing filters, you know, inch and a quarter. That'll pretty much fit on anything. Yeah. So it's, it's worth giving it a try. Uh, I'm not saying it will work. I'm not saying it won't. But uh, theoretically, it should be exactly the same. And there's no difference than me putting that filter you know, on the, uh, on my scope or putting it on the end of my camera. I don't see what difference it would make. And the same with the eyepiece. Uh, you know, I have taken, taken it out when we were down at St. Martin's and, uh, I took my two inch eyepiece. I put an O3 filter in like that. We were looking at, uh, the veil nebula through that, uh, with an inch and a quarter on a two inch eyepiece and it worked really well. We could see the veil nicely. So, uh, all I did was think of the idea. Can I transfer that to my camera? And with a step down ring from a 58 to a 48, because that's what two inch uh, eyepieces are. And then if that works, I can step it down one more time from a 48 down to an inch and a quarter and see if I can use my inch and a quarter uh, filters and do the same thing with my camera. So I just wanted to throw that out there and say, you know something, I'm going to give this a try. Uh, maybe on a later date, I'll let you know if uh, how well it worked or, you know, don't bother trying. <laughs> but you can save yourself a pile of money by only having to buy half the filters if it does work. <laughs> yeah, and they're usually cheaper than buying the drop-ins anyway. Yeah, exactly. And an inch and a quarter is a lot uh, cheaper than a two-inch. Yeah. So it's just something that I uh, thought it would be kind of cool to talk about, and it's real simple to get the parts to put them all together. And it all started with uh, just that one adapter, the uh, two-inch to inch and a quarter that came with my uh, ZW0294 camera. Mm -hmm. to step it down to use inch and a quarter filters on it. And then, of course, uh, the light bulbs go off in the head going, what else can I do with that? <laughs> <laughs> so <clears throat> it's something that you uh, may want to look at and give it a try or wait, and uh, I'll 
you know, throw it uh, down the road some of my results that I get with it and tell you if it's uh, worth trying or not or if it makes a difference when you're doing photography. So that's all have I want to talk about. What's that? Have you tried it outside just to just to see if it, uh, the, the camera focuses and all that? Yeah, I've, I've done, I've taken shots up here, like uh, just at, at my observatory or a, or a bird on a branch, and it seems to work perfectly fine. Great. I thought, well, we'll do that. It should take a picture of the sky. Yeah, the focus yep, sure, is yeah. pinpoint. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't affect it at all. So wow. I thought that was a, a cool thing to try to see if I could actually uh, step it down to an inch and a quarter on the end of a 300 millimeter lens and uh, maybe get a shot of Orion or something like that and see if it makes a difference. Yeah. So. Awesome. Well, there, there you might be on to something for everybody. You never know, you know, until you try. And it costs, it costs nothing. It all goes, you know, it came with the, the one step down ring for the camera. And then I just bought one on eBay. I think this one was $7 free shipping. And uh -huh. uh, you go from there. <laughs> $7 was, free shipping. Yeah. And it takes six months to get it. <laughs> <laughs> so you forget all about it. <laughs> I have. <laughs> Every day is like Christmas at my house. <laughs> I ordered that win. <laughs> Speaking of that, my uh, my ZWO Duo filter is on its way from Montreal. Oh, good. So nice. I mean, I was standing by the door today like a kid waiting for Santa Claus to show up, but it didn't show up in the mail today. So I'm looking forward to getting that uh, filter oh, and see what that works like. Awesome. Oh, that's nice. That's nice to know because that's sort of uh, that's been a while for that one. It has. I ordered it in March, and my credit card ran out in August. So when he originally went to, when it finally came in in September, he went to bill me, and my credit card didn't work because it was the old number. <laughs> <laughs> That's how long it was. I waited for it. <laughs> so no, I ordered really. it in March, and I'm getting it hopefully this week. <laughs> awesome. Oh, that's great. And he admitted he he, uh, he completely forgot. So yeah, <laughs> I said that's. Oh, Hey, I forget a lot. So. <laughs> oh, we're, we're on a show, aren't we? Who are you? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, whatever. What am I doing here? <laughs> we're just chatting. Oh. So what's going on behind you there, Mike? You'll explain uh, to the folks uh, what's happening behind you there tonight. Yes. Uh, someone asked, I said, that the uh, the guys are taking out the radio control X-Wing fighter for a flight tonight. So. <laughs> <laughs> uh People, I hope people are writing this down because somewhere down the right line, we're going to write a con. We're going to have a little contest and see who remembers uh, what was happening. I won't even remember. I got this. Awesome. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate that. Great talk. Um, so I guess we're off to you now, Paul. Oh, okay. Let us know if anybody, well, out, there, us know if anybody out there saves money, uh, and you'll be uh, owing uh, Mike some rights, I guess. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Half the savings. All right. So I guess um, if you want to pin me, sure, sure. Uh, let, me, let me get the thing up on the screen here first. Are you going to do a, a Rosanna? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I just got to get the, my thing working here. And that one. Share. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. Rosanna's fun fact. Now, see, when I pin you, Paul, that's not, uh, that didn't work. Now it will. There, it didn't. now you're pinned. <laughs> now the, right, I, I can't pin you. Though? Yeah, I can't pin you. I have to pin your presentation. So there we go. Oh, we're good. Okay. But if you want to do All it right. again. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here we go. Okay. Well. Time for it. Rosanna's fun fact. <laughs> See, this is the difference of doing things live. You don't go in and edit nothing. You just say blah, 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 blah. <laughs> go ahead and do oh, it. Well, yeah. right. <laughs> we missed Rosanna last week, so uh, welcome back, Rosanna, this week. And uh, she has got an interesting thing that she had said, and I'm so excited to talk about this. Mike and I talked about it a little bit earlier. And what we're going to be talking about today, oh, well, the other way maybe, is the Bendo meteorite, an ordinary space rock that slammed into a car. So what are the odds of a meteorite freaking your vehicle? In 1938, one unlucky Illinois resident found out. So 
Edward McCain of uh, Benelde, Illinois, drove a decade-old Pontiac coupe that he safely stored in his garage, which was a small wooden building with a tar paper roof. Well-worn ruts in the dirt floor marked the exact spot where he parked his car every day for years. Then on September the 29th in 1938, by sheer cosmic chance, a speeding space rock tore through the roof of McCain's garage before burrowing itself into his Pontiac. The Bendel meteorite indiscriminately nailed its target. That same year, Ben Hur Wilson of the Joilet uh, Astronomical Society poetic reported in Popular Astronomy that a small stony iron meteorite came crashing out of the battlements of, he of heaven, aimed apparently with precision of a crack artilleryman. <laughs> the cosmic cannonball not only tore through the roof seat and the floor of McCain's car, which he fortunately wasn't in at the time, but also rebounded off the Pontiac's muffler before bouncing back up into the springs of the seat. As you can imagine, McCain was quite astonished to discover the meteorite where he hopped in his car the, later that day. <laughs> <laughs> so, investigating the fall. So Wilson first heard of the event from a radio broadcast two days later. He wanted to investigate. And it was only the second recorded meteorite fall in Illinois, but the story seemed incredible in the truest sense of the word. Fearing a hoax, Wilson and fellow Astronomical Society member Frank Poussel nonetheless sent inquiries to, uh, to uh, Benold. They received recipe, uh, replies from McCain and the principal of the local high school assuring them that the meteorite was, in fact, genuine. Wow. So a few weeks later, Wilson made uh, the 200-mile drive to uh, Benel, B-E-N-L-D, Benel, I'm going to call it Benel, where McCain showed him uh, the object, a small plate, a piece of what had broken off to reveal a thin layer of black fused material coating the outside, um, <clears throat> the telltale sign of a meteorite. Examining the interior, Wilson noted round inclusions known as uh, chondrules, molten drops of silicate min minerals from early solar system, which remained visible in the material that later formed into the space rocks. So what you're looking at there is a slice of the North American, uh, the West Africa 3, 3189 meteorite, which measures about 0.8 inches across. And this shows those uh, uh, chondrules, uh, which are round mineral inclusions that appeared in the meteorites classified as chondrites. And the Bendel meteorite is classified as an ordinary H chondrite. So that's what you're looking at for that photo. So satisfied with this, that what that this was the real thing, Wilson called Poussel to come to Benel and join him in the investigation. They determined that the meteorite was roughly a rectangular block with a thumb-sized indentations measuring about four by three by three by five by three one inches in size, with a fusion crust no more than 0 0.04 of an inch, one millimeter thick. It weighed 3.9 pounds with density nearly four times that greater than water. So the numbers were all very well and good, but Wilson was also interested in the circumstances of the fall. There were two witnesses, uh, Mrs. McCain and her neighbor, Mrs. Crum. Although neither woman, uh, neither women saw the meteorite land, both reported hearing a sound like an airplane and a power dive shortly after 9 a.m. on the day of the fall. They saw no flash or smoke as might be expected from a glowing hot meteorite, this suggested to Wilson that the meteorite was cool as it fell, a hypothesis, a a hypothesis born out of the lack of any scorch marks on the car seat. So what's more, the Bendel meteorite lacks an apex. When a meteorite plunges into the atmosphere at high speed, burning away uh, material as it falls, it forms a pointed protrusion or an apex on the forward end the absence of the apex suggests that the object was not generating intense heat through air friction. It was probably falling at the terminal velocity, the maximum speed it could reach, and therefore simply punched a series of holes rather than demolishing McCain's garage altogether. So here's um, the illustration, which is part of the Field Museum's display at the Bendel Meteorite, shows the trajectory of the space rock as it came down through McCain's garage roof and into his car. 
So this presented Wilson and Purcell with unique opportunity. The neat alignment of the holes made, in the, it made it possible to measure the direction of the meteorite's final path and something that had never been done before. Thanks to the depressions made in the dirt floor by the vehicle's wheels, it was a simply a matter of putting the car back exactly where it had been on the day of its fall. The investigators then used to create the crosshairs of the center of the hole in the roof. They ran another string from it through the roof and the seat of the car to the floor on the garage, ma marking the point of the nail, mar marking the point with a nail. They then moved the car out of the garage, redrew the string, and fixed the point on it with a simple plumb bob. Using a surveyor's transit, they aligned the plumb bob with the string crosshairs in the roof to take the first measurement of the meteorite's trajectory. They found it had come from 64 degrees 46 arc seconds east of the true north and at an angle of 77 degrees 31 arc seconds from the horizontal. So, uh, do, do, do. So at the time of the fall, the line would extend the vicinity of Amirak, the beta or uh, of Mirac, which is in the Big Dipper. And having made this first of its kind measurement, Wilson remarked on how fortunate it was that the meteorite struck the building squarely. It is not recorded whether McCain agreed. So what you're looking at there, that photograph is a bundle meteorite punched right through McCain's garage roof the damaged portion of which is on display at the Field Museum. So this is actually the, the part of the roof that that meteorite went through. So a singular accomplishment. Today, we know that most meteorites originate in the asteroid belt, but in 1938, their origin was still a mystery. Wilson realized that the line he measured probably did not point exactly to the Bendel meteorite's origin as the space rock reached terminal velocity in the Earth's atmosphere its trajectory would have uh, would have dropped more steeply. Also, since it had no apex, it may have tumbled as it fell, possibly following a distribution in the upper atmosphere. Wilson put out a call to other amateur organizations seeking additional observa observations of the fall in hopes of discovering its origin, but without success. 75 years after the fall at Bendel, the, uh, the Russian meteor that streaked through the skies over Russia, I can't pronounce the name, so I'm saying the Russian meteor, exploding in a fireball that was recorded by video cameras through the region. Astronomers used sophisticated computer calculations to trace the meteor's origin to the Apollo group in the asteroid belt. The efforts of a pair of amateurs with string and a plumb bob may seem incredibly quaint by comparison. But given the tools of their time, Wilson and Purcell sure made a singular accomplishment. The Bendel meteorite now displayed at the Field Museum of Natural History in Chicago has been a favorite with visitors there for decades. It's a tangible connection between the cosmos and human society, a reminder that we are part of a much larger universe, which at any time may tap us on the shoulder or car to remind us that it's there. <laughs> That's so cool. That wow. is an amazing story. Wow. And that is this week's Rosanna's Fun Fact. Awesome. Hey. <laughs> wow. I, 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 love that story. Cool. I love that story. That's amazing. Ooh, I go right out and buy a lot of tickets, I think. <laughs> that is so cool. Am I still sharing or no? Uh, yeah, you're still presenting, I think. All right, just let me see if I can uh, stop presenting. There we go. There we go. We're back. That's a fantastic story. That awesome. Mike and I talked about this earlier before we before we got went on air, and because um, Mike did a talk about meteorites before, and he talked about how the meteor, in one case, went and bonked a horse. Yeah, hit a horse. <laughs> <laughs> the only living animal known or uh, organism known to be hit by a meteor apparently yeah, yeah. and they and couldn't the, prove it the naysayers <laughs> couldn't prove it yeah and the dead <laughs> horse sold for like half a million dollars oh my goodness that's awesome that's thanks good. Rosanna yeah, thank, you. thank that you so that was much, awesome. Rosanna. always great stories oh I'm telling you <laughs> well, where are we going now? I guess we're going to go to, uh, we'll give Paul a break for a few minutes now, and we're going to give, uh, we'll take a look at some of the photo submissions that came in. 
over the past um, week. Mm -hmm. And I got them in a couple of places. Uh, I actually went up to Facebook and grabbed the first one because it came comes from uh, Sophie Milan. So I'm going to share my screen here first of all, I guess. Oh, yeah, yeah. And uh, so we were talking a little bit about uh, Zodiacal Light. And uh, mm -hmm. Sophie Melanson uh, captured an excellent photo of it. I'm going to bring it up here, hopefully. There it is. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's fantastic. So this is the Zodiacal Light. We talked about how faint it is. Um, we can see, but it is visible on evenings when there's hardly any moon out. Um, also, uh, I believe that's Venus there. She's got coming up. That's the Pleiades there, I guess. So that would be Venus, early morning sky. So she says, uh, the zodiacal light, uh, it's a hazy glow that is going on through the bright planet Venus. Yeah, it is Venus, I guess. Uh, and going towards the Milky Way. So the Milky Way, of course, is shooting this way. It's, it does look like it's almost intersecting it. Um, she says, uh, it appears the in the path of the sun and the moon, and the best time to see it is in autumn during the hour uh, before dawn in the eastern sky or in springtime up to an hour after the end of dusk in the west. Uh, also best uh, during a, in a moonless and dark sky location away from light pollution. So she said this one was captured on Monday morning, September 22nd, uh, between 4.30 and 5.30 a.m. from uh, Century Farm Family Campground. We guys, we know that one. Uh, on, the yes. Bay of, on the Bay of Fundy in St. Martin's. And, uh, yes. Yes. One of the better skies in, in uh, southern New Brunswick for sure. And, uh, yeah, that's just, just outside the campground right there right on the beach. Like, the campground sits right on the beach, basically. So, but. I was going to say, that's T-13. <laughs> yeah. That's, 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 what, that's where my tent was. That's, yeah, pretty well. Uh, awesome shot. Very nice, Beautiful. Sophie. So, but that, that's the Zodiacal Light. Um, I've never captured it myself. Uh, and then maybe you've got to have, I'm sure you have to have pretty good eyes to pick it out, first of all. Uh, but also, she's got the, the camera lens here and the equipment to, to uh, capture it beautifully. Very nice. Thanks, Sophie. So I went I, uh, you know something? I've never seen the zodiacal light. No. Uh, and um, and that just makes me want to go out and see it. That's just amazing what you absolutely. did there. Absolutely. Very nice. Uh, next up, we've got uh, Matthew Dupre sent me in this one. Um, Paul, I didn't get the description from him, so maybe you can help me describe what it is. Uh, that looks like the Pac-Man Nebula. Pac-Man Nebula, okay. Uh, he didn't provide any description. Just sent me the picture, and I went to, I was asked him back again, but I guess he didn't respond uh, early enough to pick up his comments. Yeah, if you look at that uh, that dark uh, uh, cloud, the, the basically a whole bunch of dust and cloud. I shot this a while ago, yeah. and uh, it's a hard one to get because there's a lot. If you look closely along um, the uh, right, uh, the left side, uh, where a lot of the nebulosity is, mm -hmm. you can see there's Stuff protruding out it looks almost like the um, pillars of creation, right oh, up here. Here, here. here. No, 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 closer to the edge. Oh, yeah, right there. Right yeah, there. yeah, right. Yeah, so that, so there's all kinds of that going on, plus uh, this dark uh, uh, area here, and uh, it's a, it's a challenge to do. He did a great job on it. Mm. Fantastic, yeah. Actually done, yeah. Not sure. Yeah. Yep. He's he's sent us in a few photos now, but they're awesome. Thanks so much, Matthew, for that. I've been trying to talk to him, get his get a Facebook page up, put some of his photos up on it. That'd be nice. Yeah. He's got a lot uh, a lot of material to share. Um, it's from Trudy. Trudy oh, nice, Trudy. Oh, look at that. September the 19th, 2020, 2021. 2020, 2021. Two-day-old moon, about 9%. Love the way she caught the trees in the earth shine. Yeah, yeah. that's awesome, yeah. Got really nice capture there. That Pretty is cool. cool. Yeah. Uh, she's got this one too. Uh, it oh, says from Fundy, from, from Fundy Trail. I know she had picked a morning to go down to the Fundy Trail there. 7.05 a.m. September 19th. Long Beach. And another shot from Long Beach. Oh, man. Mm. So nice to live on the on the coast. I'll tell you. Yeah. And they're, you know, she's only minutes away from this, I guess. So awesome. Yeah. yeah. You put up with the fog a lot, but when you get a good sky, you get a nice sky. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's well worth it, for sure. No, it's really nice. Uh, Carol Bean sent me this one on my Facebook page, actually. Um, and That's I, last night. Hmm? That was uh, 
September 24th. Uh, tonight's yeah, September, so two nights ago, I guess three three nights ago now. <clears throat> so we were kind of showing that almost that view uh, last night. Um, a little bit more of the Apennines were revealed, I guess, and we were into Copernicus, I guess, down in the Arist Aristosthenes. Yeah. That's a hard one to say. Aristosthenes, yeah. yeah. So that's a waxing gibbous moon. Plenty of detail along the Terminator, she says, and there is certainly. That's the best uh, spot to watch for things that are happening on the moon, for sure. As that it it appears moon. that photograph, like she had took that almost uh, in the daytime or close to uh, twilight because there's a lot of blue around it. There is, yeah. So she's got some good detail if, in fact, that's when she took that. Mm. Yeah. Very well done. And uh, her next one was from uh, Earthshine on the Crescent Moon. She said last night, this was September 20th, so yes, sir. days before. So just a really nice young, very young moon, and always nice to see that Earthshine. Mm. See a little star up above it? A star, yeah. Yeah, and I, I caught that in mind, too. I wasn't sure what that was, but I'll have to look it up. Yeah. I was going to go back and look at it, and I got kind of just, oh, squirrel, and boom, gone. <laughs> 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 I have to look at that. Oh, wait, there's a squirrel. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Here's one from Deanna Marithu King. She sent this one in. Uh, she said, just took this tonight, Keswick. That was last night um, of our moon. And looks like Jupiter and Saturn sitting there. So the moon would have been off to the left of Jupiter and Saturn on that evening. Yeah. Nice. Lots Thanks, Deanna. Yeah. yeah, nice tree up in the corner there. She got some tree branches mm -hmm. and beautiful. Nice to frame it with something, eh? Carol Legier Glant sent this one in from St. Marie, New Brunswick. Uh, from yesterday, so I, I think it was just after our shoot the moon contest, or uh, shoot the moon, our our uh, shoot the moon uh, live feed there that some of these were coming in, and that's that's awesome. Like to me, if somebody sees a post up there and I'm talking about the moon or something about the moon, and they put up a picture, like wow, I don't, I'm doing, I'm not even asking for them, and people are putting them up anyway, so it's awesome. Yeah. To to see that they're sharing them, so it's uh it's an inviting, uh, hopefully an inviting page to have people share their their uh, their views. Uh, this one was sent up by Kim Warren. Uh, she said it was clear for here for a bit tonight, so that was last night, I guess. Very nice. Yeah. And again, the tree changed. Wasn't clear here. <laughs> no, not at all. It moon, was bad. The moon's balancing on a tree branch there. Yeah. Yeah. No, she's not going to be able to see it. Mm. And this one as well from Kim. The moon never gets old, does it? No. No. And finally, get the oh. right out here. This one from Stefan Picard. He sent me this one on uh, a message. <laughs> if you can, can't see the number, you have to. So can you see a number there? Yeah. <laughs> I have anxiety. <laughs> and this one, yeah. I, I can't see a number. <laughs> no. So you yeah. have to the telescope. Yeah. So, yep. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> That's good. I love it from Daystar telescopes, too. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a bunch there, Stefan. I always like to appreciate the jokes and the comics that come in on the emails. So, That's and of course, if you have any photos at all that you'd like to send on to us, uh, just send them to Sunday Night Astronomy Show at gmail.com. Um, in another week, I'll have a new address. Uh, my website is uh, being worked on right now, so I'll have an email address uh, for the Astronomy by the Bay page uh, that we'll be sending them to, and that hopefully will just clear it up a little bit to where they go to. So, um, anyway, that's our photos for this week. Thanks, everybody, Thanks, for contributing. Mm. And I'm going to go back to uh, our full screen again. And I guess we're back at you now, Paul, again. Oh, okay. Bum, 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 bum. Bum, bum, bum. Bum, All right. Okay. So um, this week, um, it's going to be a continuance on the um, – uh, Astrophotography for beginners, um, with uh, with the moon as our subject. So the first week we kind of covered on um, how do we take pictures of the moon, the camera settings, and all of those things. And and the second uh, portion was if we took a bunch of those pictures, how do we stack them and get them ready uh, to process? And we did just a really really short little uh, ditty on processing just enough to say that I could throw it on Facebook and show my friends. But if you want to get really uh, a little bit more into the finesse of um, uh, processing your moon picture, well, then that's what we're going to do tonight. And the forum that we're going to use that most people have 
is going to be Photoshop because most people have Photoshops in some form or another. So I'm going to um, share if I could. My mouse going again. There we go. Your entire screen. That would be this one, and I'm going to put it on over there. Okay. And what do you see? We see the moon. So let's. Uh, do you want me to pin that, Paul, to make it full size, and then not have the three of us down the side? Yep. Okay. Yep, that'd be wonderful. There we go. Okay. So, um, so this was uh, a result of um, ten images, and I think this is the same moon that we. Uh, that we finished off with on our last segment doing this. So this is a, a result of uh, 10 images stacked, um, making this uh, picture of the moon. And so we stacked it and we just played around with it a little bit to get it looking like this, which was pretty nice. And you could put that on the internet and you know, be pretty proud of that. It's a nice looking moon for sure. But if you want to do something more with this, once you got it to this point and you want to make it um, you know, pop a little bit more, uh, maybe, maybe we'll sharpen it up. Maybe we'll brighten it up. You know, maybe we'll focus on some features and make it stand out. Um, that's what we're going to do with this right now. So um, the first thing I want to do with it um, is I've already saved this on my on my um, screen uh, so that I can put it into a, um, a software called Reggie Stacks. So let's do that. So I'm just going to shrink that down. We're going to see us again just for a minute. And I'm going to open up uh, my Reggie Stacks right here, let me just give it a moment to do its thing. Mm -hmm. Maybe it will, maybe it won't. Where'd it go? There it is, can you still see it? Yes. Okay, you can see You can see the Reggie stacks, I mean? I can see yeah. the Reggie, you can see Reggie stacks, yes. Thank you. Okay, so, um, so let's select that same moon. So I'm gonna go to my desktop and we're gonna find that moon, the same one that we've been just looking at there a minute ago. And that's this one right here. So let's open that up. Stretch intensities? No, I just want to leave it exactly the same as we found it. Okay, so Reggie Stacks, first of all, and there, if you look in the top corner, um, Reggie Stacks, and this is how you spell it, is a free download. So you can actually download this at no charge to you, put it in your, uh, your computer system, and then anytime you want to sharpen up some photographs, it doesn't have to be moon, it could be anything, because what we're going to talk about here mostly are these wavelets, which is uh, over here. And what these wavelets are, it's like a, it's six different layers of uh, larger to smaller layers uh, on the moon that we can sharpen up. Before we do that, also with Reggie Stacks, they also have, if you look on the right-hand side, where it says functions, excuse me, uh, they have what they call a gamma setting. And I like to use the gamma setting because if you look at this moon, typically it's a little bit dark. So the first thing I want, would like to do is kind of brighten it up a bit. So if we go to the gamma section, we just click on it, and then we're going to get a, a little bit of a what looks like a curve that you would see if you're using uh, curves in Photoshop. And it does sort of the same thing. So it's going to basically give us a, a gamma stretch or detraction, depending on which way we push this little arrow. So if I push just this arrow up, or the circle rather, up in the center, you're going to see, when I let it go, that block. So that block basically um, is telling me that is what will affect it. It's not showing you the whole moon, just the area that you're of your interest. I will, I don't want it there. I want it a little further in where there's a little more, a little closer to the terminator, but yet I still want some of that uh, uh, brighter moon surface. So all you got to do is just put your mouse where, where you want it and double click it, and it'll move right where you want it to go. So there it is there now. So it's in a nice position so that I can see when I'm lighting up uh, the moon, I wanna brighten this area up a little bit more, but I don't wanna over brighten this area. So, um, so what I'm gonna do here is I'm going to create another point and I just right click and it creates another point. So you can see when I adjust this, you always have to let it go before it'll actually give you the adjustment. So I can create a little bit of dynamic range in there if I want to. So I want to make it just a little bit brighter, but I don't want to lose the detail in the shadows. And then if I go up here and I just take my center circle, drag it a little further and create what we call an S curve, it'll flatten it out. If we don't like the flat look, simply push it back up 
and we're starting to get into a little bit more dynamic range again, which is what we're after. So once you're satisfied with what you think the, is the curve that you like, then all you have to do is go up here where it says do all. You simply press the do all button and it's gonna go through and add all of that to the entire surface of the moon. So now we've brightened our moon. It looks considerably better and easier to see because I, I found personally that it was too dark. I didn't like it that much. So, so we don't need the wavelets any, or the, uh, the gamma anymore. So we'll just turn that off. Now we're gonna pay our attention over here to the wavelets. So what these wavelets do, and I'm just gonna demonstrate for you, if I take this slider and I push it to the right and I just let it go, you're gonna see, I'll do a real extreme. So you can see this is the area here that I'm working on the moon, but we wouldn't know that. So let's go back to our original position and then let's show the processing area. So you can see there's a little corner of a white line here, another corner of, or, or a corner edge of another one, another one here and another one here. So this is the area that we're focusing on for our sharpening. And again, you can do the same thing. You can double click it and move it anywhere you want, but I think this is a good place to start. So, um, so now let's push that over a little bit and you're gonna to start to see some sharpening happening <laughs> right in this area here. So that's starting to look pretty darn good. Now, this is what I call a salt and pepper um, process because it's the kind of thing where you kind of do what you like with it. So a lot of people would start with the first layer of wavelet and then work your way all the way down. I like to start with the finer detail and then work into the larger areas, which is the bottom one. So if I push that one up, you can start to see more detail again in here. So, and again, you don't want to over-process because if you over-process, this is what's going to, this is what it'll look like. You see, you start to get all those artifacts, all the, all the whites are blown out. It's just looking really terrible. So you'll know when you pushed it too far. So let's put that one back to where it was. So you can see that I'm being very, um, very um, reserved with the amount of sharpening that I'm placing on this. So, and I might just, maybe just to push this one a little bit more. And again, this is more um, experimenting and finding what you like. And once you've got that section that you like done, you say, you know what? I like the sharpness. It's not overblown. It's not over sharpened. I think it looks terrific. You go back up here and do the same thing that you did for the gamma and simply hit do all. And it's gonna go ahead and do all those adjustments to the complete surface of the moon. So now we've got that done. So now we've got a sharpened moon. So now we're going to take, and we're going to save this image. And we're going to call this one um, Reggie Stacks Process Moon. And I'm going to save that to my desktop. So let's save that. Okay, that's done. We don't need Reggie Stacks anymore. Let's turn it off. Let's go back to Photoshop. And let's open up Reggie Stacks Moon. So open. And we're on our um, page. Reggie Stacks Process Moon. That's the one we just did. So let's open that up. Okay, so there it is. So now, just to give you an idea, um, well, I'm going to show that one later. Actually, I'm going to turn that off for now. And I want to show you, I'm going to give you a... a an arrangement where you can see the two different moons where we started and where we are. And I'll take this one up to 66% like the other one is. And then we'll put them side by each. And then you can see just with those two adjustments that we did. Oh, the other way. Click on this one and go this way. And I'll put them both the same orientation. So you have a look and tell me which one you would like to see, which one looks more, which one's brighter, which one's sharper, which one has a lot more definition. Uh, and I would certainly say it's the moon on the left, which is the one that we just put through Reggie Stacks. And we did a gamma adjustment and we did uh, a wavelet adjustment. So now we've got something to work with. This one over here is great, but now we know we can do way better. So now I'm just going to close this one off because you don't need it anymore. And we're going to look at this one. 
So the first thing I see here that I would like to adjust uh, through Photoshop now that I'm looking at this is I find that my, my white areas in some cases are a little bit too bright. So, <clears throat> excuse me. When you have, have Photoshop, you just simply go to filter and you go to where it says camera raw. It's gonna throw you right into a camera raw filtering system, which is very similar to Lightroom. And we're just gonna blow that up that same size, grab that little hand down in the corner, and then we can move the moon around so we can see the area we want to look at. So right now, I want to take some of this white stuff down. So all I'm going to do is push this slider all the way to the top, and I'm going to go to where it says highlights. And I'm going to bring my highlights down just a little tiny bit. So now you can see I'm taking a lot of that overly white, bright area, and I'm bringing it down. And it's not affecting anything over by the Terminator, pretty much this side of the moon, really, simply because that's where the highlights and the brighter portions of, that, of this image are. So once I've got that done, then I'll go down here. There's three buttons called Texture, Clarity, and Dehaze. And I'm just going to slightly touch those just to give the moon a little bit more dynamic range. So let's go to Clarity first. Push it slightly to the right. And you're going to see now that the Maria, the seas, the flat area, the darker areas are starting to stand out more when I press that clarity because now that's starting to bring out that area of the surface of the moon. If I want to make it just a little bit more sharp or a little bit more textury, that's what the texture does. You can push that over a little bit and as you can see, it'll start to pop some of the textures. But at the same time, I'm starting to blow out down here. So you got to kind of keep an eye on everything when you're looking at this. So I'm just going to put those ones back. And I just want to kind of show you what those were for. You can dehaze it. And when you dehaze it, it darkens it down again, but it gives you a really strong dynamic range between light and dark portions of that moon. So if we're okay with how this looks, excuse me, um, then we're just have to simply hit okay. And it's going to throw us right back into Photoshop. There's where we are. So there are basically just three simple adjustments I made to that original moon, and now look what we have. If I didn't like that last adjustment that we made on camera raw, and I'm thinking, you know what, it's a little bit too dark, it's kind of looking more like the old moon did when I first started, simply go up to where it says edit and undo camera raw. And there you're back to where we started. So you can approach this as many times as you want or as many times as you don't want to make those adjustments. Um, I wanna show you one other thing uh, on sharpening the moon, if you haven't sharpened through, excuse me, through um, Reggie stacks and you want to sharpen your moon another way, I want to bring in another picture and show you um, another way to do this. So just bear with me while I find that photograph. Actually, I'm going to close that. I'm going to close this. I'm going to go over here. And where was that image that I had earlier? Uh, good golly, Miss Molly. Um, I suppose it doesn't matter which one I grab. Um, let's grab, oh, I wish I had saved it. <laughs> okay, we'll just use this one. Actually, no, no, I don't like that one. Sorry. Bear with me, folks. I just want to find that image I had. Uh, where is it? There it is right there. over here, our Facebook back, our uh, Photoshop. Okay, so anytime that if you're working with a couple of screens or if you want to shrink down your uh, your Photoshop, you can just click and uh, grab and drag right over onto Photoshop and Photoshop will open it right up for you. Well, could not complete your request because it's not the right kind of document. Uh -huh, it's the shortcut, that's why. Okay, file, open, and I'll open that shortcut. Whoop. There. There we go. So that's kind of a messed up picture. It was one of my earlier ones. <laughs> but I think everybody who knows the moon a little bit knows what that feature is. And that's what they call the straight wall or rupus recta. And you can only see that at certain times of uh, certain times on the moon phase. And that long fault line, of course, is uh, is a feature. Um, it kind of looks like a sword. If you look up one of the old swords from back in the 
the, you know, the days that the white coats fought, or the blue coats and the red coats, they used these kind of swords, and there was the sword handle, and there's the sword uh, blade. Um, but anyway, it's what they call um, the, uh, the straight wall. So if I want to take that, and if I want to sharpen some of the, uh, some of the uh, portions of that, there's a way that you can do it with uh, by using uh, layers and by using uh, what they call the high pass filter. So by combining the two of them, we can make, we can make, we can make some really, really nice sharpness adjustments, but not globally because the other sharpness adjustments that we were making on with the other soft software were basically on the whole surface. If you want to concentrate just on certain features by us using this technique, I'm going to show you, this will help you do that. So the first thing you want to do is you want to make a copy of your image. So in order to do make a copy of uh, a second copy of this image, you simply press control J and then you now have a second copy made. Once you've got that second copy made or that layer copy made, then um, the filter uh, that you want to choose is called the high pass filter. So how you find the high pass filter is you go to filter, you go to other and you go to high pass and you turn it on. So the first thing you're gonna see is, oh my gosh, it just messed up my photograph. Well, no, it didn't really. It's just giving you the ability to turn um, your photograph, as you can see, I can choose many different levels of sharpness, brightness uh, on this particular image. So it's basically, it's just a high pass filter. So if I just wanna do something without a lot of effect, but enough effect that it's gonna you know, make a difference on my image, I might put it up to say 15. We'll try it there and see what happens. So we'll say 15 is good to go. The next thing I need to do is to create a layer, a mask for that. So we're gonna to go to layer, we're gonna to go to layer mask, and then we're gonna to go to hide all. And what it's gonna do is gonna create a mask over on this layer, and this mask is black, which means it's hiding everything that's behind it. What we're gonna do now is we're gonna, uh, we're gonna take a brush and we're gonna be able to poke holes in that mask and work on just specific areas. Before we do that, we go to our uh, little section up here where it says normal, and we're gonna click on that, and we're gonna choose the selection where it says overlay, because we want that to overlay over top of what we're looking at. Then we're gonna go over to this side and go down where we choose our paintbrush, simply right click on it, press your brush tool. Now you see the brush tool has got a little circle on it. If you wanna make that circle or that brush bigger, you can simply go up to here where it shows the little brush icon, press that down arrow, and then you've got size of brush. So if I wanna make my brush bigger, see how much bigger my brush is? If I wanna make my brush smaller, you can see that I'm shrinking my brush. You can also go to your keyboard and you can use the, uh, the bracket buttons. You push the bracket to the right and it'll make the brush bigger, push the bracket to the left and it'll make the brush smaller. So there's two ways that you can adjust your brush. So once you've got the brush the size that you want, which in this case is a little big, the, bigger than I want it, I want to make this a little smaller because I want to just I just want to fine tune some areas. So now that I've got the brush cho chosen that I like, um, now I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to start making some adjustments. So um, what we're going to do here is I want to make my crater walls a little sharper. So I'm just going to brush that area there and make this just a little sharper. And then I want to make the, this whole um, uh, feature, the, the straight wall, I want to bring that a little sharper too. So I'm just going to brush over that because I want that to be sharper. And you're going to notice that there are, and you may not be able to see it on your screen, but there's some little tiny craterlets out here. So I'm going to brush over those two and I'm going to sharpen them up so that you can see those little finer details. And don't worry, folks, because it doesn't look like I'm doing much now. But when I'm done, I'm going to I'm going to show you an A and a B uh, comparison so you can see what we're doing here. Now, um, if I want to also bring out a little bit more sharpness to perhaps th this cr a crater area up in this area, I'm just going to brush over it. OK, so now we know that we've worked on this section. We know we've worked on. Um, the edge of this crater, and we certainly worked on the straight wall. If you look over here again to your layers, where your layers are, you'll see this little eyeball. If I take that eyeball and I turn it off, and you keep your eye on that rec uh, loop of rectangle, and you're going to notice a difference. 
And where you're going to see the difference is, and again, it's a slight difference because I didn't paint it heavy, but you look at this edge of this crater right here. I'll turn it back on, back off. And you can start to see that I'm getting some sharper, more detail in that area. You also look up here in this area. I'll turn it off and on again. And you can start to see some differences there. If I chose to use a larger brush, I'll turn this back on. If I want to go to a larger brush, again, I can increase my brush size and I can affect a larger area. So let's say just for just for fun, let's paint all of this. Let's just sharpen this whole puppy right up. And again, remember, we're only on about 16 or 17 percent sharpness on, on the high pass. So now let's look at it off and on, off and on. Uh, layer, copy, layer. So, see, if I went down there and pressed the layer here, I'm starting to erase what I just did. So if you make that mistake, don't panic. Just go back up to where it says edit, undo brush tool, and then that'll shut right off. Go back up and make sure that you are actually on the layer that you're actually working with. So you can see I'm doing the same thing. So I just want to go back to here. Edit, undo brush tool. And then that's what we're doing here is we're just sharpening is all we're doing. And I'm going to sharpen the whole thing a little bit. And then off and on. So you can start to see areas that I've worked on. So again, it's it's uh, it's uh, it boils down to how much, um, uh, to what degree do you want to make this sharp? To what degree do you want to make this uh, soft? If I just want to work on a very specific part of a feature of the moon or whatever uh, picture that I'm working on, I can use this uh, layering and high pass technique, and then I'm able to um, I'm able to uh, give you those differences. And um, and again, you can look at the differences off and on, off and on. Again, just look at this area of these craters. This we just notice the biggest difference right now, but it, depending on, on how, how much time you want to spend on it. Once you've made that change, and if you find that it's a little too strong, you can go up to where it says opacity, click on that button, and then you can actually, you can see I can turn it off completely. So if you look at this crater right here, and I turn it up on full, it's, it's gotten brighter and sharper. So I can put it anywhere in between. So if I'm finding that 100% is too much, um, maybe 66 or 75% is where I want that sharpness to be. So again, you've got total control over how much of that effect you want, and you can actually affect any given spot on, the, on that feature that you're working on. And that's called high pass um, layers uh, sharpening. So that is that. I'm just going to turn that off. Oh. No, there we go. And I will get back to where you guys are here. No, going to find where we are. There we are. <laughs> and stop presenting. There we go. So that was pretty simple stuff. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Hello. Hey. I muted myself. You're on Facebook. What are all your? No, no. Was, I muted myself. Okay, I'm going to ask you a question then. I want to see if you're paying attention. Oh, I was on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'll go ahead. <laughs> no, I was. Oh, to me. <laughs> <laughs> were there any questions? No. I just muted my mic. I'm looking for questions. Um, do, 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 do. Nope, don't see any questions. Okay. But well, it, it was an excellent presentation, and I did follow yeah. along with you because I, but I could never do it. Like the shots <laughs> that you put up, I could go back and look over that video a number of times, but hopefully I could pick it up eventually. But it it does yeah. like the the difference is just astounding. Yeah. Well, anyway, it's just two forms of uh, two forms of sharpening uh, that you can do with your with your moon after you've done the original stuff. Right. And uh, so again, that's for those who want to maybe dig in a little deeper. You know, maybe they have a larger moon because if you're only got a small moon, you know, at 100% of your photograph and it's only really tiny, well, a lot of that stuff you're not going to see a whole lot of it. You can do a global adjustment if you want. Right. But if you want to have a larger moon and there's sp specific spots on the moon that for some reason, this wasn't quite as sharp as you wanted it to be. 
but you don't want to touch anything on the Terminator, then you can go anywhere you want on that moon with that second technique and just go ahead and just adjust very specific regions. That was pretty cool. Yep. Awesome. Yep. Very good information. And we're going to carry on with your, your topic again next week, right? So. Okay. Yep. And what are we going to talk about next week? I know. <laughs> <laughs> Are we going to get into deep sky stuff at that time, or are we going to continue with the moon? Um, no, I think we kind of covered the moon. There's not much more you can do with the moon. Right. Um, other than shoot. Actually, you know what? Yeah, there is one more thing we will cover with the moon. Okay. And I think what we'll talk about is shooting the moon with live video and yep. then uh, using a video and, and actually making an image from that. Be because uh, with that, instead of using 10 pictures to make an image like we did, we're going to be looking at maybe using 500 pictures right. and making an image and show the difference. That sounds great. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Like it. Something to look forward to. Okay. Someone else can talk. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Emil does say uh, it should be noted that Registax wavelet sharpening works best with a stacked image. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Emil. Yeah. Uh, from here, I guess we're going to go to, uh, I just, uh, where are we at anyway? We're about, uh, let's look for time. Nine thirty. Nine thirty. And all is well. In. Hmm? And okay. all is well. All is well. Okay. Well, two or three minutes on uh, what's coming up in the night sky, then maybe for the next week. Uh, all right. Okay. Let's. I'll do really, really quick. Let's get back. Well, if you're here in St. John, it'll be fog, fog, fog. <laughs> <laughs> but we have to do it for everybody, Mike. <laughs> and, and we can't always trust the weather, man. Right. So. Never. If I come events, the fog filter is going to be rich. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's see if I can get anything up here at all. Uh, find my desktop. This guy out of the way. And maybe I can bring him over. Hope again. <coughs> you guys are seeing that okay? Yes. Okay. So just uh, a very quick look at um, what's happening um, over the next week. Uh, of course, the full harvest moon comes up on uh, Thursday night, 6.05 p.m. So we can advance ahead to Thursday if we like to, to take a look at the full moon. But I just set it up for tonight's sky right now. That's at 9 o'clock actually tonight. Um, but anyway, the full harvest moon arrives at 6.05 uh, Atlantic time on Thursday. And uh, of course, that's going to be the first full moon of October. Uh, but it's not going to be the last full moon of October. Our second full moon is going to arrive on Halloween. That's oh, pretty cool. Hey. Yeah. Hey. Hello. Hello. Yeah. So a full moon on Halloween night. That's that's not a very popular uh, uh, task, I don't think. Maybe it is. I don't know. But <laughs> anyway, it's going to be kind of cool for the kids to get out and around and the full moon out. And um, anyway, Bob. Uh, Besides that, though, uh, just a little bit of talk about the planets, I guess. So we've got, of course, we've got Jupiter and Saturn sitting here in our, our southern sky right now, just right next to Sagittarius. Um, they're going to be sitting here for a while yet. Um, they're in the south uh, dusk and early evening. Then they move, of course, over to the southwest as evening grows later. Um, Jupiter is the brightest object. It's the fourth brightest object in our sky behind the sun, the moon, and then Venus. Uh, Saturn is about 7.5 degrees to its left-hand side there. Um, watch the two planets gradually etch together now over the rest of the fall. And uh, as we get into our later months, I'm going to move along here. Just move it along in the time. There's October, the end of October. Here's November, but we'll have to move our time back a little bit to see them in our, in our November sky. But let's move ahead to December. Of course, that's the big date coming up on the 21st when they're going to be less than one degree apart. Less than 0.1 of a degree apart closest they've been in over 400 years from our point of view so there's our view on December the 21st and look at how much we can zoom in here we've got that's going to be low on the horizon isn't it that's going to be very low at six o'clock yes it is yeah. yeah and then there but you'll be able to catch it a few days before and a few days after as well right uh, they just won't be quite that close of course but here we are there's our distance less than a degree yeah so Jupiter and the four moons, Saturn and some of its moons, all in the eyepiece at the same time. And it hasn't happened for 400 years to be that close together. I mean, they've, they've been close, but not that close. So uh, that's something to look forward to. So we'll see that building over the next uh, 
number of weeks, so keep an eye on our evening sky over the next number of weeks as they get closer and closer leading up to that date. Um, let's take ourselves back to our, our normal date now again and back to our normal time in the evening. And we're at the 27th, I guess, we're right now. Yeah, so anyway, Jupiter and Saturn in our evening sky. Of course, we've got uh, on the other side of the uh, horizon here, we have Mars that shines uh, big and bright right now as it closes uh, in on its October the 13th, uh, October the 13th uh, opposi opposition. And there it is in the tonight sky. But if I move the time ahead a little bit, we see the moon end up joining it here on October the 2nd, which is uh, Thursday night. Um, after dark, it glows uh, or, low, uh, orange low in the east, just a bright Jupiter, but uh, yellow orange to Jupiter's creamy white. It'll be as bright as Jupiter, actually. Mars climbs higher through the evening, and it stands at its highest and telescopic best at 2 a.m., daylight savings time. Um, on Friday, though, uh, the moon and Mars will rise together, and they will be less than 2 degrees apart. So again, the two of those together in binoculars. Uh, later in the night, watch them draw farther apart. And although they look like companions, Mars is actually 155 times farther away uh, than uh, the moon. And although uh, Mars looks very tiny, it's actually twice the moon's diameter. So we're already getting the best views of Mars that we're going to have until July of 2033. So get out there and enjoy Mars now. Uh, if we go back to our morning sky, I'm sorry, if we go back to our evening sky and we look into our southwestern part of the sky, spinner clock around here a little bit just our early evening sky and we can try to do a search for mercury but uh, mercury is very uh, low to the horizon right now uh, that's it that's seven o'clock if I bring on our day our daytime uh, sky though the way it would look there it is there so we can see that it's pretty low uh, by eight o'clock it's almost set but you can pick we can actually pick, uh, pick it out uh, right around 7 30 or so if you've got good eyes right after sunset we've got probably about 20 minutes or 25 minutes before uh, it disappears completely and you might get a view of uh, mercury it's not at the uh, high of its point of its orbit right now it's very shallow in the ecliptic on that point so so you can try for it um, it uh, it's still very low uh, at least it's fairly bright at magnitude zero this week um, bring binoculars at least about 15 minutes after sunset while twilight is still bright scan for mercury just above the west southwest part of the horizon if we spin over now to our morning sky i'm going to zoom us back out again we're going to look over to our morning sky now and i guess that's probably one of the easier ways to get there of course we have venus up in our morning sky venus is uh, about minus 4.1 right now magnitude which is fairly fairly bright uh, it's rising in Leo. Um, it's in deep darkness almost two hours before dawn begins in the east-northeast. By the time dawn gets underway, Venus shines prominently in the east. And we can watch for Venus and Regulus on the 2nd, which is uh, the state. Why am I not seeing that? Hang on now. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. No, I'm, a, I'm in September. There we go. That's better. <laughs> Let's look at the right month. Here's Venus and Regulus. In October the 2nd which is Thursday so they're going to be uh, less than uh, a half a degree apart so again pick those two out uh, easily in binoculars Regulus and Venus uh, the only other thing I really wanted to mention was uh, the uh, the meteor showers that are happening spin this back to tonight's sky again for a second be really quick and if I bring on our meteor uh, button here, right now we've got the Orionids that are happening. I guess I'll have to go back to our morning sky to get those. Oop. Orion's rising now, a little earlier in the evening. And we have the Orionids up here. Uh, the Orionids are, the peak activity for them is uh, between October the 2nd and November the 7th. Uh, the Orionids are actually medium strength shower that sometimes reaches high strength activity. In a normal year, the Orionids produce about 10 to 20 uh, shower members at maximum. In exceptional years, like there were between 2006 and 2009, the peak rates were on par with the Perseids, which is a really good show, about 50 per hour. 
uh, recent displays have produced low to average displays of the shower. So, of course, October 2nd, leading up to around that time, we're into full moon. And uh, our, we're, we're back into a waning uh, gibbous moon at that time. So the moon is up in our late evening when the Orionids are supposed to be at uh, peak. So we might not get much of a show with the Orionids. Um, <coughs> but the better show really comes in, in December. Uh, that's the Geminids. And... Um, if you, all you have to do if you're using Stellarium 2 is just go down here to the bottom. You can see a shower button here, a meteor shower button. Click them on and off. It'll tell you. And the Geminids come along in uh, December. Next period of activity for them is between December the 4th and December the 17th. And the Geminids are usually the strongest meteor shower of the year. And meteor enthusiasts are starting to circle December 13th and 14th on the calendars because that's when the peak is. This is the one major shower that provides a good activity prior to midnight. Uh, as the constellation of Gemini is well placed from 2200 onward, uh, the Geminids are often bright and intensely colored. Due to their medium slow velocity, persistent trains are not usually seen. And these meteors are also seen in the southern hemisphere, but only during the middle of the night. The shower uh, details in these ones are at the zenith hourly rate, which means the the, uh, the the amount that you would see straight up, I guess, zenith hourly rate would be about 150 uh, per hour. Uh, so that's a really good show, and the good thing about the, the peak this year, um, on December 13th, 14th, is that the, the moon's only going to be 1% full, so you'll have a nice dark sky to pick them out. So I know it's cold in December, but uh, it's worth it getting out on that evening for sure, take the family out and take a look at the uh, the coming meteor shower. There's always two or three meteor showers anyway happening. I can, if I bring this on again, you can see that there's the Orionids, the Southern Torrids, uh, there's a, there's another one popping up uh, earlier in the evening. Uh, they kind of overlap, um, but these are all minor showers. So if you are out in any particular evening, you want to take a look at where they seem to be coming from, and you can tell if they're in a ride maybe or a southern torrid, autumn arids, northern torrids. Like they just go on. There's a, I think there's over 40 meteor showers per year. That um, most of them are minor, but the bigger ones are are of course the Perseids and the Geminids, uh, which are the ones that are are coming. So. Something to look forward to as the winter comes on. And that's all I get to say about that, guys. Wow. 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 Yeah. Lots going on. Lots I can't wait on. to see that little uh, combination of those planets so close together. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody also put up a picture of it, I'm sure, for us. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who that's going to be. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's pretty cool. We can do that. Look, yeah. Uh, wow, looking forward to that. Of course, uh, it's going to be cloudy. Emil says, "Yeah, I know." There you go. That way. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, folks, I guess that's uh, that's all we're going to do for tonight. Paul, we're going to look forward to your presentation again next week. Uh, Mike, I'm sure we'll have something to to bring on with this. We're looking uh, at uh, a gentleman that may be joining us next week. Um, I shouldn't really talk about him yet because I'm not sure if he's going to join next week or the week after. But uh, Chris Wiedek is, is talking about joining us for a talk about light pollution, which is a very important topic for all of us. Um, uh, what we're seeing out there right now is that our planet is getting brighter and brighter from space. And uh, we can certainly tell where where the uh, the cities are. And that, that after that evening glow that we get, that light pollution that we have, uh, drowns out the stars for the rest of us. So we have to try to get that under control somehow. And uh, I, I'm hoping Chris is going to be able to join us next week to talk a lot about light pollution. He does know a lot about it. So let's, we're going to look forward to his talk next week. So we'll put that out there that that'll be our talk next week. And Paul will be doing a talk on more about DSLR uh, photography. Uh, Mike, we'll, we'll get something up for you, I'm sure. I'll be looking for the, the weird space article. So if you guys can find any anywhere, let me know. <laughs> <laughs> I'll keep an eye on it. I'll watch for weekly world news to see if anything's happening along the way. So uh, in closing tonight, folks, again, uh, our special thanks for your continued support out there. And thanks again to Rosanna for her continued contribution to our show as well. Thank you, Rosanna. Uh, remember, we do love getting your photos. So send them to Sunday Night Astronomy Show at gmail.com. And we'll be happy to include them on our next broadcast. Um, we're also looking forward to suggestions for topics for future shows. So if you have anything that you would like us to discuss in a future episode, we're always looking for topics. Uh, please send your request to the same address, Sunday Night Astronomy Show at gmail.com. And we'll do our best to make it happen. We've still had a lot of cloudy nights on this show over the last year, guys. I guess uh, about 90% yeah. of our nights or more have been clouded out. So we had to come up with topics. And we can rack our brains a little bit. But uh, it's also nice for people to come out with some suggestions of what they'd like us to talk about on the show. So 
Uh, we also asked, too, if that you've enjoyed the content here tonight and you joined us from YouTube. I guess that's where you're joining us from tonight. <laughs> Nowhere else. <laughs> please consider giving us a like and subscribing to our channel as well. And please let your family and friends know that we are here every Sunday night at the same time to help educate you on the night sky and entertain you as well. So for now then, from Mike and Paul and I, uh, stay safe, everybody out there. We wish you all clear skies, and we hope to see you all again here next week. And remember, as we like to say, please keep your co scopes pointed up. Have a great week, everyone. <laughs> see you all again soon. Good night. Big hands. Big hands. <laughs> <laughs>